Okay, so somehow cohesion fell off the planet. So I know you've already got these notes, but if you have any test question whatsoever that has anything to do with water, you want to have water as polar. Those three words need to be written on your paper immediately. So I'll start off with that. So you've already got this written in your notes. Actually, I had these notes written up four times because I've done the recording. Anyway, sometimes technology, not my friend. So for cohesion, if, of all the ones that we've talked about, this is the one that's the most important. So it's going to be the basis that drives all the other properties that we looked at for water. If water didn't associate with itself, then you wouldn't have you wouldn't have any of the others because the hydrogen bonds that are there, that's what drives all the other um, properties. So this is just water is attracted to itself. That's it. And the reason it's attracted to itself is because it's like a little magnet. You know, we had, I had those little waters over here that I was showing you before, and there's an orientation that's predictable. So that's the key. Is it's not just attracted to itself, it's attracted to itself in a predictable pattern and arrangement. So the arrangement is predictable and um, that's going to be what drives the properties. So it's because the arrangement is predictable, let's put it that way. Because the arrangement is predictable, um, the water molecules, they begin to act like a collective. So that just means they, they act like one thing. They act like a collective unit. And so that's going to give you these predictable behaviors that they're going to have. So, let's see if I can find the last time I did this. It'll be right here. So we're going to go back through again and be sure that we're clear about polar and we understand about covalent bonds. So, let's be sure we're, we're cool with that. Because as soon as you say this, you really do need to demonstrate. So, when you're answering questions, you're really not answering a test question. You're providing insight for the person who's reading it that you understand the, the material, like you understand the concepts. So polar has to do with any type of molecule that has a difference in charge across its, itself. So it's a molecule that has a difference in charge and this is going to sound crazy, but across the molecule. So that being the case, you can label some of it positive and some of it negative, and so it's very magnet-like in its behavior. And when it's behavior, you want to think about how it orients itself. Orient means place itself in space. So polar has to do with, anytime you're talking about polar, you're talking about molecules that have difference in charges. And so that lets them interact with other molecules. So it's going to give it the ability to interact with other molecules. So right here we're talking about water with water. So because water is polar, which means it has an uneven charge across it, it's going to orient itself in a predictable pattern, and it's going to be something where the, those hydrogen bonds become um, cumulatively 
a, a big deal. Like it's hard to break them when there's that many. So let's go and, and we talk about what gets you to be polar. So yeah, I've got this difference in charge, but so how did I get to be polar? What caused that? Electronegativity. I think in one of your videos, um, definitely you should watch the great big long huge ridiculous video notes before you do this. This is just a missing piece and I don't know what happened. Like I stitched that together in Movie Maker and I'm guessing, I don't know, I have no idea what I did. But anyway, so you'll understand this better if you've done the other part first. But regardless, so for electronegativity, it's, we've written all this down, but we're going to keep writing it. It's the ability um, to, to, to draw electrons, not draw, but pull the electrons to itself. And it's all because of the atomic forces. Um, you've got oxygen, and oxygen is higher up, has a lower atomic number than the others in its, in its column. And it's going to be extremely electronegative because it's small. So if you're small, that means that your electrons are closer to your nucleus and there's more atomic um, just factors going on. I mean, there's just a relationship there that's tighter. So small atoms are going to have higher atomic interactions with the electrons in the nucleus. So oxygen is just like set. It is set to do this. It's noise and it's, that's so quiet here. And I know that's loud on your end. I apologize. So let's walk through again. And we're going to be silly because I have no problem being silly. The sillier something is, the better you remember it. I don't know if you've ever figured that out, but you remember the kind of weird things. So I don't have a problem being that little weird person. So if I had water... We need to speak about these bonds. Covalent bonds are like a hack. You know, we talk about a lot of this stuff in chemistry, but it's in isolation. It doesn't really have a, a story with it. But living things hack the way the world runs. So oxygen definitely does not have a full shell but it behaves like it does because it's sharing electrons with these two hydrogens. Same thing for the hydrogens. So you get the ability to, to have the same properties of being stable from having a full shell, but you really don't have one. So living things have a way of working around the, the problem and making things work. So when you have a covalent bond, this is something that people, they mess up. They just don't get what's going on. Covalent bonds, you know, I told you, living things don't like permanent. They like reversible. And when I say like, I don't mean that literally, but biological systems don't do well with things that can't be reversed because most everything has to come into alignment and have homeostasis with its environment. And you do that by having something and breaking something and making something and you have all of these different um, reversible cyclic interactions and patterns. So a covalent bond, it's reversible, but it's only reversible if you have the enzyme that, like a little machine, that can actually break the bond. It's very stable. So let's write some things about that very stable. When I say reversible, I don't mean that, you know, it's fleeting at all. 
it's very stable and it it cannot be broken without some enzyme actually that's made just for that molecule and that bond to actually torque it and break it. So it's going to stay there until you choose purposefully to break it. So it cannot be broken by increase in temperature or any of the things that are going to happen to this water. So not by movement or by um, orientation to some other molecules. So it's not, they're there. They're stuck with that. They're going to stay in this bond angle alignment until you purposefully break it. So you need to keep that in your head that these covalent bonds are a done deal. Like they're set. And a good idea when you're talking about water in particular is to add that this is a polar covalent bond. Not all covalent bonds are polar. If you're sharing electrons, you're covalent. But that doesn't mean that you're always unevenly sharing them. So unevenly sharing anything that oxygen is involved in always will be unevenly shared. And let's just write oxygen's little idea about things. So I'm going to put, if I were oxygen, this is what I would say. Why would I share? Sharing is overrated. Why would I share? I have the ability to hold the electrons longer by me. I'm going to do that. Why would I share? I keep electrons longer by me. Hydrogen, on the other hand, has to say, I just can't hold on. to electrons for very long. So remember, I did the whole way that, like the electron cloud, the electrons are gonna slow down around oxygen, and then hydrogen can't hold on to them, can't hold on to them, and then they slow down around oxygen. Hydrogens can't hold on to them, stay longer here, Hydrogens can't hold on to them. They stay longer here. That's where you get the dipole. And you get your partial charges. So since I can't seem to hold on to electrons very long, you have something that we talk about in here all the time. It's called relative. When I compare two things to each other, I can say that there's a relative difference, meaning that Hydrogen compared to oxygen, there's a difference. There's a relative difference. Hydrogens are relatively positive compared to oxygen. So we'll put that partial charge there for positive, partial charge down here for negative. And now we've built the point. Like this is how we get the cohesion. So up until this, we don't have the ability to cohese. That will work. I don't know. We're going to draw water. This is super important. You're going to have this. I don't think it'll be part of your test. It'll just probably be a quiz. And you're going to take it until you do it right. So let's get it right the first time. And it seems like a really silly thing to be so determined that you understand. But if you don't understand water, you're going to really, really struggle because biological systems are water-based and they completely and totally have to abide by what's going on with having a polar your polar molecule that is creating a dipole because of electronegativity. So let's draw water and I'm going to make a list of things over here that you need to have. 
So this will be a short free response. You'll have to draw water with water, water with sodium ion, water with the chloride ion, and draw them oriented correctly with all their parts. So here's how you do it. And this sounds crazy, but people mess this up and I don't know why. If I ask even a first grader what is the water, they would say H2O. But people will do the weirdest things like put two oxygens and one hydrogen, and I don't get it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw our water right. So we're going to draw two hydrogen, and we're going to draw one oxygen. So I'm going to put it in the middle. So two hydrogen, one oxygen. Then we're going to draw the covalent bonds. If those are going to be as a as a like a dash, and I color code everything, so these are going to always be when I draw them yellow. So there's one water, and we're going to go ahead and completely put all the information around this one water, and then we're going to add another water, and we'll keep adding them until we end up with this water and three around it. That's what you're going to have to do for your short free response. So, now that I have water, there's information here that I have not given you, which is let me tell you these partial charges because that's going to be how I determine where I put my next water. So, hydrogens behave like they're positive. So, there's all you have to do if you think about it with this is just. But don't don't just put just positive. Basically, you're you're drawing an S with the the bottom loop back, back toward itself. Nobody's going to care if this isn't drawn the way that you think it should be. So we're going to put add the partial charge. So partial positive for hydrogen. Okay, and then you're going to add. Partial negative. Why did I? Oh, because I didn't put it. The partial negative for oxygen. Okay. So again, I'm all about color coding. I'm going to just box in the part of the molecule in blue that has a partially negative charge. Need to. And I'm going to box in in pink. The parts that are the positive behaving parts of the molecule. So there's one water. This is not cohesion. So an emergent property is once you have enough of something, it behaves differently. That's really what emergent means. So water by itself, it, it's not cohesive. It doesn't have any of the things that would make that an important driving property. So now I have to decide where I'm going to put my second water. And I'm going to have to orient it correctly in space. So I'm going to go ahead and see how this is pink. It's always going to be a pink with a blue. So I've got to think about it. This is one water. I'm going to put my second water up here. But I'm going to put the oxygen closest to the hydrogen because it's going to be attracted to that. So let's follow my steps again. So now for I'm going to repeat all of this for my second water. And I'm going to, I'm like I've taught this for forever, so there's a lot of things I can tell you. People get like, oh, I have to write steps down. Good great, this isn't that difficult. Wait till you have to do it with no steps. And I give you a piece of paper. All of a sudden people are like, oh no. It's not bad to give your brain steps to remember. And then you get into a pattern of how you do it. So the first thing I did was I drew my water. The only thing that's different for the second one is I had to think about the direction in which I put it. I had to make sure that the oxygen is oriented toward the hydrogen of another water. So I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do now. I'm going to do partial negatives, partial positive. I'm going to add my colors in. Because you have to label every single part. Well, color coding is labeling. Now I don't have to label anymore. So I'm going to 
show that that's the part, positive part, and now I've got two waters. The, the thing that changes now that we're starting to build more than one water is you do get cohesion. So now I've got to add my hydrogen bonds. And they're always going to go between waters. They're not within a water, they're between waters. So I'm going to add the hydrogen bonds. And here's what I need to think about. Why did I put that oxygen there? I put it there because I was going to place it to show the attraction between it and this hydrogen. We'll draw the attraction. So I were a red pen. Probably be right there. So draw your hydrogen bonds. There's no magic number of them. It just depends on how close you drew those. So until I had two, I couldn't put hydrogen bonds. Now I'm just going to repeat. So I'll repeat for the third water. There's no right or wrong about where you put it. Maybe I'll put one down here. So oxygen of this water. So this is one water. That's one water. That's another water. I'm going to draw another water. So I'm going to put hydrogens close to this oxygen. So let's put a hydrogen here. I've got to draw two hydrogen, one oxygen. Put my bond in for my covalent bond. It's not changing. It's stuck those together. Put in my partial charges because of the electronegativity of oxygen. Why would I share? I can keep the electrons more to myself. So partial negative, partial positive. Then I'm going to use my color coding so I don't have to label. That's the negative part of it. It makes sense that the positive part would be oriented toward the negative part of the other water. So here's yet another water. And once I have these waters close to each other, I can draw hydrogen bonds between the two waters. And so I might as well just show that these are both going to be attracted to that. Nothing wrong with that. That's the way it came out when I drew it. So the directions would say, draw a water. Then draw three waters associated with that water. So I'm going to do another one. I could just draw one down here. You're supposed to draw it off of the middle one. So I am going to, I don't know, let's draw it different. I'm going to take it, no, I did an oxygen. Let's do some more hydrogen. So I'm going to come over this way. I'm going to draw the hydrogens attracted to this oxygen. So draw two hydrogens. I did that. I put it oriented toward an oxygen on another water molecule. Done. So repeat for fourth water. and draw my covalent bonds. I did it. Add your partial charges. I haven't done that yet. Okay, now I've done it. Now I'm going to add color. Because I don't want to label. And I need to draw my hydrogen bonds. So I made sure we were oriented this way. So this hydrogen from the fourth water to the first water but I bet that one's also attracted. And then I'm going to just show you that that's its own water. Done. So this is one that you'll have to draw. Has it done it before? Done it before? Okay. And then you're going to have to draw these. You're going to have to know that sodium is positive. You're going to have to know that a chloride ion is negative. I'm not telling you that. The directions will say, draw a chloride ion and three waters associated to it. Well, do I have three waters? Let's just see. So chloride's negative. I would expect to have a big old circle of hydrogens belonging to other waters. And I do. So here's... 
one water. Here's another water. And here's the third water. So I have three. I have the hydrogen bonds. Everything's there. Now I'd have to tell you what the labels are. You don't have to do the blue and the pink boxes. I just do that because I can quickly go. Chloride's negative. I should have just pink around it. Sodium's positive. I should have just blue around it. So you would have to know sodium's positive and oxygen's going to be attracted to it from all the waters. How many waters do I have? There's one. Ooh, that's getting crazy. There's two. And there's three. Because if you don't get this part, you don't understand anything about how biological systems work. Silly as it is. Okay. Look, this is my fourth time I've made this. You come see me next week. I'm super excited. We'll stay safe. We'll all be fine. I cannot wait to see you. So excited. Guess what? I forgot to write something really big on here. What's the reason why that water sticks with water? Because I need to cut it. So, cohesion. Hydrogen bonds. It's driven by hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds where? Between, not within, between waters. They're fleeting, they're weak, but there's lots of them. So having lots of something gives it power. And so they're constantly going to make and break and make and break and make and break and reorient themselves based on the kinetic energy of the system. But the bonds between them, they just keep making new ones wherever the water moves. So as it's moving, it is constantly always associated. So you know how I am with my little weird things. So when Hunter was a baby, now you got to remember, he's almost 30, so... There weren't a lot of people who had the little, I don't know, backpack leashy things. They didn't even make them. So I went to PetSmart and I asked the lady, because he was so fast, it was like lightning. And I was going to pick my mom up at DFW, which is a ginormous airport. And I knew he'd get away from me, like I was terrified. So I went to PetSmart and I said, do you think he's a medium? in a harness. Well, the lady was like dumbfounded. She thought I was an awful mama. So, put him a little harness on, got the little retractable leash thing, and put that to him. And he thought that was the coolest thing ever because he could run till it was done. And then he knew that he could like, I would reel him in like a fish and he'd be like, mama, I'm a big fish. But anyway, that's what this is like. They're never untethered to each other. Hunter was never untethered to me. So they're always connected. Now, are these two always connected to each other? No. Like milliseconds. You can't even hardly measure it. It's fleeting. There and gone, there and gone, there and gone. But collectively, they're all always collectively connected. Weird word. Do you get what I'm saying? It's like they're tethered so that they behave as one thing, and that's where you get cohesion.